Good morning and welcome today. We gather together today to worship the Lord, knowing that he has risen and is with his Father and our Father in glory, praying for us and meeting our every need. For he, the Lord Jesus Christ, has ascended to his Father God and by his intercession for us can enable us in all that we do and say. We also remember that by his death and rising again, he has opened the gates of the kingdom of heaven to all who repent and believe his holy gospel. And he enables us to forgive those who have wronged us. Welcome to today's service of Holy Communion from the White Book, if you have it, on page 47. And welcome if you are joining us online. We'll now join together in our first hymn of praise, crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne.
seated. We will now pray, so if you feel more comfortable kneeling, feel free to do that. Please join me in prayer. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. We thank you, almighty God, that our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, the perfect sacrificial lamb who died that we might live because in him you do not count our sins against us. Help us to confess and repent of those thoughts, words and actions that have not pleased you so that we may receive your forgiveness and stand in the gap for our sinful world where many who do not know you and even deny your existence break your laws and persecute your people. We thank and praise you that Dr. Ken Elliott has been released after seven years of captivity in Africa, after being kidnapped with his wife Jocelyn in 2016. Thank you that prayer has changed that situation and that you have released him. And we now pray for Dr. Elliott as he recovers with his wife and family. Gracious Lord, we pray for our war-torn world, fractured by political and territorial ambitions across the globe, for the people of Ukraine and Russia, locked in bitter struggle. We ask you to bring peace and healing. For the people of Sudan, once again trapped in civil war, with many fleeing their homes and becoming refugees. For those in Kenya and other countries in Northeast Africa, who after years of devastating drought, have now lost what remained in appalling flooding and destruction. For other countries, such as Congo, Yemen, Ethiopia and North Korea, where oppressive regimes and warring tribal or religious factions destroy lives and livelihoods, have mercy on your people, Lord, and give them the courage to stand under persecution and to remain faithful to you as they witness, some even unto death. Lord of the Church, we pray that you would empower your ministers, pastors and evangelists as they strive to share your peace and love with those in their congregations and surrounding communities. Especially we pray for Kanishka, our Archbishop, Chris, our local bishop, James, our senior minister, and Jeremy, Anne, and Erin, our assistant ministers, in their leadership and pastoral roles. We also thank you for the many years of service we have received from Jenny Warren, our office administrator, and we pray for her as she leaves us to take up a full-time position. We also pray that you will provide someone to replace her who will be able to facilitate the efficient running and ongoing outreach of our parish. We pray that you will keep each of our leaders mindful of their responsibilities to you, dependent on your grace and enabling, and faithful in service to their own families, to one another and the church family as a whole. We remember the Blackwell family in Bulgaria, praying for safe traveling for Kate and Andrew as they head in and out of that country. We pray for strength and wisdom in their responsibilities in the International Bible Church in Sofia, particularly as they look for a permanent pastor to head the church, and also in their leadership roles in the European Christian Mission in Spain and Portugal. We also remember Ellie and Tom in Australia, that you will keep them safe and strong in their faith while the rest of the family is in Bulgaria. And we give thanks that Ben and Will seem to have settled into their school and communities in Sofia. Lord of the world, we pray for the leaders of our country. For Anthony Albanese as he attends the G7 gathering in Japan and the Quad meeting there too. We pray for the members of the federal parliament as they make important legislative decisions and plans 
especially in the run-up to the referendum on The Voice. We pray for Chris Minns in the New South Wales State Parliament as he establishes his government and policies, that he might understand and seek the good of the people of New South Wales. And we remember those in local government who are responsible for infrastructure and the necessary services for our communities. We give thanks for all that we have here in Australia. But at the same time, we remember those who are facing real difficulties in making ends meet due to huge increases in rent and the price of living in recent months. Lord God, give us compassionate hearts and where possible open purses that we might give out of our plenty that those who do not have sufficient for their needs might have enough to survive from week to week. We remember the Kuma woman, Claire Nowland, now fighting for her life after being tasered in her care home. And we ask, Lord, that where there will be increased and effective training for our police officers in the use of weapons such as tasers and in dealing with people who are unable to respond to the usual demands for compliance due to dementia, mental illness and other disabilities. Have mercy on her and give wisdom to those in the police forces to make a right and just response to this and other tragic situations. Father God, we thank you that you know our requests and needs before we even ask for your help. Bless, keep and heal those in our church family who need restoration to health and strength. We especially remember Andre Kreises, Jen Bishop, Dawn Ferguson, Adrian Binnings, Annette White, Laurel Willis, Peter Corrie, Maureen Peatman, and Jim and Marion Simmons as they continue to recover from health issues and learn to live with disabilities. And you might also take a moment to pray for any others you know who need our prayers at this time. Lord God, Father, and our daily help through your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, strengthen us in thought, word, and action to be more like our Lord Jesus, that we might live to please you at home, at work, and at school, and in the community. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us pray on page 47. Almighty God, nothing is hidden from you, not even the secrets of our hearts. By your Holy Spirit, purify our deepest thoughts so that we may truly love you and bring honour to your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you turn the page to page 48, we will read these commandments. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Lord, have mercy on us and by your Holy Spirit write your commandments in our hearts. We'll now say the collect, which I hope is on the screen. <laughs> Father, help us to keep in mind that Christ our Saviour lives with you in glory and promise to remain with us until the end of time. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. 
We'll now have the Bible readings, the Old Testament and New Testament readings followed by the Gospel readings. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 32. Psalm 32 of David, a masculine. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was snapped in the, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did, not cover up my iniqu- and, you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. That's Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Sin, faith, duty. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is written in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 21st verse. the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owned him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he asked, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. 
But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please remain standing and we will join together in the Nicene Creed, which will be on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Jeremy will now bring us a message from the Lord. Thanks, Anne. Good morning, everyone, and good to see a few new faces uh, with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing Peacewise with you a little bit later and enjoying uh, learning alongside of you. going through a series called Growing Together. And we're doing a two-week uh, sermon series, or like, like I suppose, combo on uh, repentance and, fa- uh, and forgiveness next week. Uh, so you've got repentance from me this week. Um, I remember a, a movie in, in Madagascar. It's a, it's a movie, I think, from about 2010. Uh, in a side plot... There's four penguins. The names are Skipper, Kowalski, Rico, and Private. And they're stuck in a zoo in uh, New York's Central Park. And they want to get home to Antarctica. And they've been plotting their, their moves and their escape. And they, they have a particular set of skills. And they, they eventually hijack a boat, which they somehow steer down to Antarctica. When they get there, there's this great moment. They just, you know, the boat's stuck there and they get down, it's like minus 40, and they just say, now what? Wow. Now what? A lot of Christians, I think, have a similar idea of repentance. You know, so you repent your way into the kingdom of God, whatever that means. Now what? After all, Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, 
That's what it's about if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven. And Peter, uh, you know, the, the apostle Peter said the same thing. In his first ever two outreach sermons, the first outreach sermons ever re recorded, he says, repent and be baptized, each of you. Repent then and turn to God that your, your sins may be wiped out. Repent and you'll be forgiven. That's how you get into the kingdom of heaven. But what about faith? What's with the dodgy theology from Jesus and Peter here? Where's the faith? Well, of course, it's repentant faith and faithful repentance uh, that draws us and keeps us in Jesus' kingdom. And like uh, Danny Rojas in Ted Lasso's, oh, Ted Lasso is famous for his football is life. Uh, you might not have seen it. I do encourage it. It's on Apple TV. Uh, for, for the Christian, repentance is life. Repentance is life for the Christian. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And here's the thing. Why repent? Well, the kingdom of God is near. It's the proximity of God's kingdom. So, once you're in God's kingdom, does the proximity of God's kingdom increase or decrease? It increases. So, if the reason we're given to repent is the proximity of God's kingdom, then, of course, when you're in God's kingdom, we must repent all the more. And this is the thing. If we don't understand repentance, if we don't live a life of repentance, we're going to struggle to grow as Christian individuals, but also a Christian church, a Christian community. We'll struggle to grow in godliness and love and unity will struggle to impact the world and our local area with the gospel will struggle to understand and show forgiveness and that's for next week but if we don't understand and demonstrate repentance we're not going to grow or to flip this more positively to be a community that will grow and reach out and make an impact we first need to know what it looks like and what it means to be a repentant community so where to from here? I just want to look at two things. What is repentance to God? Or what is it and isn't it? And what is and isn't repentance to one another? So what, what is repentance? Well, it literally means to turn around, to, to go in the other direction, to change course. But ultimately, uh, repentance is for our hearts, not just our behavior, and we see this quite clearly in Psalm 32, but uh, I, I want to say there's two things, actually. Uh, repenting, as we see in Psalm 32, is an uncovering of sin and a hiding within. An uncovering of sin and a hiding within. So, let's, let's look at the first one, the uncovering of sin. Have a look at verse 5 <clears throat> in, verse, in Psalm 32, and we're going to keep this open for a while, Psalm 32. It's a great psalm. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So, repentance starts with a naming of reality, the fact that we have sinned. Um, I did not cover up my iniquity. And I must say, this is the last thing any of us want to do, isn't it? To uncover our, our sin and to acknowledge it. Um, T.S. Eliot said this uh, of guilt, the, the great poet, uh, nothing is more characteristic of the human sense of guilt than its indelibility, its power of asserting itself with unabated poignancy in spite of all lapse of time and all changes in the self and in its environment. In other words, guilt sticks and you carry it with you. You take it everywhere because you take you everywhere. Your guilt and failings become you. They define you. They haunt you. They haunt us. Have you ever wondered why the most natural instinctive response when we're faced with our own guilt is to cover it up? Why? Well, ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were covering up their nakedness, this is what we felt. Well, it wasn't really their nakedness that they were covering up, was it? I mean, they were always naked. They saw themselves as God had seen them, beloved, precious. They'd always rested in that until, as we see, they took the fruit and they'd taken control of the narrative. 
grasped control of how they were seen and valued in the world. And now they had to prove that they are worthy because of what they bring to the table, not because of what God thinks of them. And so their, their lives become a big project in cover-up. I'll call it Operation Fig Leaf. And isn't this all of us? You know, we, we must define how others see us. We must show everyone that we are in control of our own lives and destiny and actually quite good at it. How, how do you feel when someone seems to be doing a better job of this whole life thing than you? Even people you're close with, it's envy, it's, it's cynicism, it's jealousy. This is Operation Fig Leaf. We cover up our guilt and we, we can't bear what it says about us and we come up with our own fig leaf strategies. We, we blame others. It was my parents' fault. It was their fault. Uh, they shouldn't have been standing there. I'm misunderstood. Or we ignore it. Uh, we forget it. We, we go shopping. We get drunk. Uh, we binge on something. We drown it out. We watch some s- sort of silly show like uh, Ted Lasso. Or, or we get cynical and look down at others as worse than us. We compare ourselves to other people's guilt. Or we just atone for it. We, we give money away. Or we kind of partake in a bit of religiosity here and, and then. And, or a bit of morality. We feel good about ourselves. We donate to a hospital wing or something like that. All of these are strategies to cover up our guilt and our sense of inadequacy. It's Operation Fig Leaf. But Operation Fig Leaf eats at us. It rots us at our core because... You take your guilt everywhere with you. It doesn't go away. You're just covering it up. And do you feel these words from uh, verse 3 in Psalm 32? When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped. The turmoil of Operation Fig Leaf, this angst of covering up. But do you notice the change in the next verse? Literally, uh, the change of repentance in the last two lines. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. When I kept silent, my bones were wasting away, but then I acknowledged my sin to you. I didn't cover it up. See, this is David, you might remember. David, murderer, adulterer, manipulator, liar, uh, power abuser, King David. David experienced this. When we cover ourselves, we unravel, but when we uncover our sin, God covers us, which is why David starts his psalm with this. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, not by us, covered by God. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. See, only when we uncover our guilt will it be covered by God fully? And this is Jesus, who on the cross was our atoning, guilt-destroying, sin-bearing sacrifice on our behalf. He covered our sins. But repentance is not just a, an uncovering of sin, but it's also a hiding within Because notice where Psalm 32 finishes. Have a look down at verse 7. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. See, if we see repentance as as mere uncovering of sins, like, I did it again, I did it again, I did it again, that is just moralism. It it just assumes God just cares about your behaviour, and that's it. No, God wants your hearts too. See, repentance isn't just sorry for my behavior. That's just moralism. Real Christian repentance is to finally find a hiding place in Him. Not hiding, not doing the hiding ourselves, but finding our hiding place in Him. It it, it confesses our behavior, but it also confesses a heart which covers up. It confesses the behavior, but the, the operation fig leaf bit too. And instead of hiding from God, real repentance hides within God's love. Instead of hiding from Him, we hide within Him. We discover that our value lies in His delighting in us. 
We see our value, His love demonstrated at the cross. And this is where real Christian repentance leads us, not to despair and guilt and self-pity, but to the cross where Jesus Himself was stripped bare and uncovered in our place so we could be covered. He was the one who was exposed on the cross so that we could be hidden in His love. He was the one who was accused so that we could be acquitted. See, the cross shows us that we can hide in God because He delights in us. He was willing to take our guilt on Himself to be exposed in our place, not to make us lovable, but because He loved us. And only when we are hidden in Him will we be be truly free from guilt and the the self-despairing nature of Operation Fig Leaf, washed perfectly clean by the blood of the Lamb, perfectly spotless. And this is how we can hand over the fig leaf, by discovering that instead of hiding from sin and hiding from God Himself to be lovable, we can instead hide within His love shown on the cross. And therefore, only when we are hidden in Him, beloved, perfectly spotless, only then will we find the safety and the power to repent to others as well, which is the second thought, repentance towards one another. And similarly, just as repentance to God is more than uh, the behaviour bit, it's also the heart bit, same with us to one another. It's, we're, we're repenting not just of the hurtful things we do, but the hardened hearts beneath them. What do I mean by that? Well, I've heard it described like this. Don't know if you've ever been on the beach, lying, kicking back. Mim and I actually were at Boomerang Beach once and we just were walking back home and the shark alarm went off. We thought, whew. You you know, you're on the beach and you're sitting there, there's this kind of triangular thing in the distance. So, is that a, what's that? Is that a seagull? No, it's a shark. Well, actually, all you can see is the fin, but of course, underneath the fin is a dangerous, deadly shark. But the thing is, we so readily think of repentance as just the fin. (laughs) You know, apologizing for the hurtful things that I said. Oops, sorry, it's been a tough day, or I haven't been myself, I shouldn't have said that. See, that's just dealing with a fin. But what's under the fin? It's a shark that inflicts real damage. See, what's underneath our hurtful behaviour and our hurtful words. It's a hard, hateful, prideful, angry, proud heart. And this uh, flows out of Operation Fig Leaf, doesn't it? And this is the danger. We we just deal with the behaviour so often. We say, oh, I'm sorry that I, I, I said that, without naming the dangerous bit. You know, some great advice that I've heard is, if, if you're thinking of repentance to another, one another, ask first for insight before forgiveness. For example, at work, if you've ever been there, um, you know, if you've ever shut down a subordinate's annoying question because it's 4 p.m. on a Friday and you're about to go home, instead of a, the quick self-deprecating, oh, forgive me, big week, you know, Friday... Why not say, look, I realise that I was just very short with you and it's unfair and I'm sorry, is there anything that you would like to say about that? It's asking for insight. Perhaps you can even say, I I can imagine your experience of me at the best of times is painful because that's my unforgiving heart. Uh, So, whenever you need, just feel free to just speak up to that and and name that. And I'll shut up and listen. Imagine saying that at work. Imagine saying that to a subordinate. Imagine saying that to your kids. You know, imagine what would happen and what would occur in our workplaces across the world if we just asked for insight instead of just said, oh, sorry, please forgive me, I said something mean. Right? if we openly took responsibility for the impact of our actual hearts and the, the shark, not just a fin. 
We need to be very slow to ask for forgiveness. And at worst, I, I just want to give this warning because it's very important. Asking for forgiveness can be a coercive tool used by abusers to manipulate and control people and continue patterns of abuse. At worst, the demand for forgiveness is, is a tool. You know, you, you should forgive me. God tells you to forgive me. I'm asking you for forgiveness. I want to just say, if, if you're some, someone wondering if you need to forgive someone who's been abusing you and is demanding your forgiveness, you do not need to forgive them. Their demand for forgiveness is not just evidence of abuse, it is abuse. It is spiritual manipulation and abuse. So if safe, please find someone to talk to. If safe, leave and, and seek refuge and help. And of course, uh, we are always available um, after the service, especially to talk about this. But even at best, when we ask for forgiveness, we, really, we need to be very, very, very slow to ask for forgiveness. And this is why. At best, even at best, asking for forgiveness, say, saying, oh, please forgive me for that, it actually just functions as a circuit breaker to actually avoid deeper conversation about your heart. You know, say, oh, I'm sorry for those words. Well, actually, sure, you just ask for, well, please forgive me for those words. You ask for forgiveness, maybe they'll give it. But you've just cut off the opportunity to inquire about your heart. Let me give two different uh, you know, versions of asking for forgiveness. First version, I'm, I'm really sorry if my words were really harsh and hurt you. Do you think you can forgive me? It's a nice way of putting it. Versus, I'm so sorry that my heart is so hard, uh, has been so hard towards you, I say some really damaging things. Can you help me to see how that affects you? See, we've been taught to say the first, haven't we? But, question... Which conversation is going to hurt you more? Which conversation is going to help you to see where your heart actually needs to change? The first one or the second one? It's the second one, isn't it? So often, asking for forgiveness is another way of saying, sorry about the fin, <laughs> sorry, if my, sorry if my words hurt you, but the shark underneath, the thing that does damage is left untouched, and it cuts short the actual process of repentance. In fact, nowhere in the Bible, really, does it say that we should ask another human being for forgiveness. Now, uh, in Matthew 18, which we just read out, it probably comes closest, where we see the begging uh, of the debtor, but there's no explicit cry for moral forgiveness of a moral failure in that respect. Instead, we're told to repent, which is not always the same thing as asking for forgiveness. So I'm saying that, I'm not saying don't ever ask for forgiveness, but I am saying that asking for forgiveness for behavior without asking for insight, well, it might not be repenting at all. An example closer to my life. Um, Mim and I often get up to do early to do exercise, and it was about six o'clock in the morning, and my, my headphones were in, and, I was, and music was already, already blaring, and I was at home, and then my little three-year-old Olive just jumps out. It's like 5.50 or something, and she should be in bed. And she says, surprise, it's me! It's very cute. The most joyful face, full of joy, but I was, I was shocked. The music was going, and there's Olive in front of me, and my face darkens and my tone lowers. And, you, know, you, you should be in bed, Olive. Off you go. No, good morning. No, oh, there you are. No, not even a smile. And Olive melted. You know, my, my daughter's first experience of me that day was grumpy disdain. And, you know, kids are beautifully forgiving. 
And there's the apology I offered back home when we got back and the cuddle that we had and we had breakfast together. It was very lovely, but that's not repentance. See, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And then he repeats himself in Colossians, Fathers, don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. And you know what? It's interesting. You'd, what would you expect a common theme to be to, for Paul to repeat to fathers? You'd expect him to say, fathers, bring them up in training and in instruction of the Lord. But what does he say? He says, don't exasperate your children. That's the, that's the thing that he, he repeats. Don't exasperate your kids. And so often I see, and maybe you see kids as the disobedient ones, not listening, making poor decisions, when actually it's me, the adult, with a fully formed prefrontal cortex, as I'm the one who is breaking God's single law that he's given us for, for parenting multiple times a day, per child. See, repentance is the way of life. Repentance is life in the kingdom of God. So, if you want to really grow your children up, show them what it looks like to repent by repenting to them. That's what repentance looks like for me right now. Not, not saying sorry for getting grumpy, but actually putting my heart on the table, um, placing my impatient and critical heart towards the children and Mim and people close to me on the table and, and letting people name it and confessing it and shutting up while they just talk to it. It's not a one-off sorry, but like, do you want to talk about that again? Have I, so have I finished repenting? No. Have I repented? Yes. But I'm never going to stop repenting. See, it's a gift and it brings us together, but it, it grows us painfully sometimes. It's hard. And can I ask, please feel free to hold me to that. Ask me how that's going and can we please be this kind of community that asks one another how that is going? Because that's a community that cares about hearts, not just behaviour. So how are we going to grow in this? This is a very difficult exercise, getting rid of Operation Fig Leaf. Uh, only as we truly, fully repent to God and find our hiding place in Him, only then will we find the resources and the, the robust sense of self to repent to one another, to find the courage to put our sin on the table and shut up and let people talk about it. And in the knowledge that they love you deeply and your, that your Heavenly Father loves you deeply, not being too quick to ask for forgiveness, but being quick to ask for insight. Not pushing for forgiveness, but pushing for more of our hearts to be exposed and forgiving those who want their hearts to be exposed to, forgiving one another, but more on that next week. Let's pray. Father God, uh, as we consider our own hearts, as we consider the behaviour that flows out of them, we, we just know that there is so much to repent of, to turn away from. Um, Operation Fig Leaf is well underway uh, and we just pray that you'll give us a, a, a daily, a greater glimpse of your love demonstrated on the cross, uh, that we might hide within that instead of hiding from you and from one another. So help us to grow as a community that does repentance well, uh, without fear, without uh, retribution, uh, but an openness and a safety that comes from the gospel. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think we're going to sing now. Uh, repent, uh, so, uh, sweet feast of love divine. Let's feast now.
Uh, we continue the service, if you have the book, on page 51. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ can come only because of his great love for us. For although we are completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, Jesus instituted this holy sacrament which we are now to share. But those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love towards us in Christ Jesus. You who are truly sorry for your sins, reconciled with others, and determined to lead the new life of joyful obedience to God, draw near with faith and share in this holy sacrament to strengthen and sustain you. But first, let us confess our sins together to the Lord our God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you made all things and you call everyone to account. With shame we admit that we have sinned against you in what we have thought, said and done, and we deserve your judgment. We turn from our sins and are truly sorry for them. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all that is past. Enable us to serve and please you in new life, to your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have promised to forgive the sins of all who turn to him with faith and repentance. Have mercy on you, pardon and free you, from all our sins, could strengthen us in doing good and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen to the welcoming words our Saviour Christ says to all who turn to him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Hear what the Apostle Paul says. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Over on page 54. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Always and everywhere it is right for us to praise you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. Through your most dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, after his glorious resurrection, he revealed himself to all his apostles. In their sight, he ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us so that we might also ascend to where he is and reign with him in glory. Therefore, with the angels and the multitudes around your throne, we proclaim your great and glorious name in words of never-ending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, Lord Most High. And let's say together this prayer of humble access. Merciful Lord, we come here to your table, trusting in your measureless grace and not in our own goodness. Even though we are not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table, you are always rich in mercy. Gracious Lord, enable us by faith to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, so that we may be cleansed and forever dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, 
that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to save us. By this offering of himself, once and for all time, Jesus made the perfect, complete sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, satisfying your just demands in full. Jesus commanded us to remember his death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who eat and drink this bread and wine may remember his death and share in his body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread in his hands. He gave you thanks and broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup in his hands. He gave you thanks. Then he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen.
please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll now join together in a prayer of thanksgiving, which I'm sorry is not on the um, screen, but it is in the book. It's on page 57, so if you happen to have the book, please read the first prayer of thanksgiving. Point 22, at the top of page 57. In your fatherly goodness, Lord, accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences. Though we are not worthy to make any acceptable offering, we present to you ourselves as living sacrifices. This is our spiritual worship, Fill us with your grace and heavenly blessing through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours forever. Amen. We will now join together in the Gloria, which is on the screen. Uh, take a seat. Now, just a few notices. James is out uh, saying hi to the Peacewise folks. Um, uh, of course, uh, we would always love to connect with you via this QR code, but always in person. Uh, so, but if there is any details that you'd like to pass on that you don't want to slip through the cracks, this is a good way of doing that. Um, as always, uh, there's prayer afterwards um, up the front. And if anything from today's sermon uh, struck you um, and you'd like to pray through that or talk to someone confidentially, that is a good opportunity uh, for you to do that. Um, on the 4th of June, so in a few weeks' time, uh, at the Downings House, we have a newcomer's lunch. So if you're feeling newish, if you'd like to welcome some newcomers, if you'd like to bring some food, uh, please do uh, look at the news sheet and you can uh, get in touch with the office uh, if, you, if you'd like further details. Uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, or this coming Wednesday, we have a work forum. Cara Martin is coming to 
uh, talk about really what, how we can use our time intentionally, whether it's paid time or whether it's uh, unpaid work that we do just uh, intentionally, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is uh, that we do, paid or otherwise. Uh, and we've got a little video to show that I think was on last week as well. Martin. I'm really looking forward to coming to speak to you all at St John's on the 24th of May. I'm going to talk about one of my favourite subjects. Um, actually, I think it's probably my favourite subject, uh, faith and work. I've written a couple of books, including a workship, how to use your work to worship God. I'm combining two things that are normally separated out for us, this idea of worship and work, faith and work. And when I say work, I mean everything, anything you do with intent or purpose, not just paid work. Uh, I look forward to coming and speaking with you. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about is how we can move from being mandarins to being peaches. I'll explain more when I'm there. Um, but I think God wants us to be peachy Christians at work. I also look forward to talking about a gospel approach to work, how work is good, how working has been impacted by the fall and how our work, our workplaces and our working relationships can be redeemed. As well as that, there's going to be a panel of amazing people from your own congregation talking about their work and how they see God in their work and through their work and at their work. So much to talk about, really looking forward to it. Uh, good to meet you on the 24th of May. Thanks. Very good. Well, I hope you're peachy keen for that one. Uh, and uh, before I pop down uh, for the blessing, I think Ken has something to say as well. Most of you are aware that I'm the toy pickup person at Playgroup. But Sue and I are going to be away for the first three weeks in June, in June. So I'm looking for a volunteer to chat to me after the service who might be interested in helping out on Mondays at about 11 o'clock for no more than half an hour. Thank you. Today we have considered how it is only the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, who can cleanse our hearts of the selfishness and waywardness that is our natural bent. Only he can show us how to turn from our wrong ways and care more about others in our families, our workplaces and communities. To care more about them than we do about ourselves because that's where our hearts go wrong, isn't it? It's me first. We continually sin against our Lord and God and against our neighbours, and we need him to show us how to put things right, how to deal with the wrongs that we have caused and to give us courage to follow through and do what we need to do to put things right. Then and only then can he give us his peace and make us peacemakers and bridge builders for his kingdom in the world. So as we think about these things, we will say the blessing. And before we say the blessing that's on the screen, I'd like to share you, with you this blessing from Ascension Day. Christ, our exalted King, pour upon us all his abundant gifts and bring us to reign with him in glory and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us today and always. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And for those of you who are going on to the Peacewise Conference, that will start in the hall at 10 o'clock. But I believe there's morning tea before that. There might even be morning tea during that conference. I'm not quite sure. We'll find out. Thank you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.